Okay. So, congratulations. Let's move on. Um, so, this, so the last lecture uh, looked only at firms, not at like the whole market in equilibrium. Uh, and now I'm going to try to turn to the whole market in equilibrium and I'm going to treat some of what you may have seen as like the most technical, difficult, complicated issues, but I'm going to try to do it in a pretty intuitive way. Uh, we'll see what you think. So um, I'm going to talk about how large numbers of people help ensure the existence of equilibrium. I'm going to try to link comparative statics to uniqueness and stability of equilibrium. I'm going to talk about income effects and why they're not that important for most of the problems that we solve. Um, uh, and that will show that equilibrium is actually quite a lot like individual maximization. I'll talk about that. And then uh, I'll use this to establish some principles of tax incidence. Um, and I'll tie together the incidence of many different types of economic regulation, uh, intervention to the incidence of taxes. I'll then go through some applications to international trade models, like the heckscher olin model of pure trade, the, uh, the Stolper, and we'll talk about the Stolper-Samuelson theorem, about who gains and loses from trade. We'll then talk about the uh, smith krugman mellitz model of the division of uh, labor. Um, and uh, across countries. So we'll talk about what are called home market and agglomeration effects. And then we'll talk about the Eden Cordum model of comparative advantage, Ricardo Eden Cordum model of comparative advantage, and we'll consider an empirical application to um, uh, agricultural trade. Okay, so all uh, the standard stuff that you do in equilibrium existence assumes that people have smooth uh, uh, con convex preferences and so forth. And um, the problem of uh, when you have non-convex preferences or you have goods that are not like infinitely divisible uh, can create some technical problems for the existence of equilibrium. But um, in reality, most goods are in fact uh, indivisible. Uh, Houses, you can't buy 0.3 of a house, you can't buy 0.7 of a car, you can't buy like a fractional part of a radio spectrum, you have to actually buy these goods in lumps. And so it's sort of strange that the standard theory that you guys are used to learning is all based <coughs> on people having uh, smooth uh, commodities where you can buy any amount of it that you want. Yeah, Oliver. So, we only did price theory. Yeah. Kevin Murphy kind of waved away the issues of um, indivisibility by saying, like, either you, you, know, you purchase cars at a certain rate, or you can rent it, or you can. He always made arguments like that and said, well, I don't think indivisibility is a problem. Yeah, so I'm going to show you that indivisibility isn't a problem, but I think his reason is wrong. But I think that it isn't a problem, as you'll see. So indivisibility creates problems for existence of equilibrium, but as we'll see, only when there's a small number of people. And when there's a large, and when there's a small number of people, um, there's no uh, reason to think that you should have competitive pricing anyway. So I, I, I basically think that's the wrong reason uh, to wave away uh, that issue. Um, okay, so let me give you a very, very simple example of this. So imagine that there's two individuals and two goods. One is named Charlie, and he views the two goods as perfect complements, and he values getting the pair of them for one dollar. Sonia has an either-or valuation. She wants one good or the other, but she has no value for getting the second good if she already has the first one, and she values getting one of the goods at 75 cents. Now, if you guys read my papers, you'll know that these are two co-authors of mine. Uh, uh, anyway, so uh, there's no competitive equilibrium in this case. Um, Matt O'Keefe, is Matt here? Yeah, Matt. Why is that true? Uh, Try out different prices. See if you can find one that would be a competitive equilibrium and see. So what a competitive equilibrium is, is that there's some prices and people can buy and sell freely at those prices. 
uh, and there should be some demand that clears the market at those prices. Sonia will never buy both, right? She'll only ever buy one. But if it's cheap enough for her to buy w at least one, what would happen? Charlie would buy the other. Well, not necessarily, but you could have one low price and one high price, and then Charlie wouldn't buy the thing. But if she's the only one buying, then there's always one good left over. So that, that can't work. So Charlie has to buy, right? Unless a good has like a, you know, yeah, I mean, in, uh, otherwise we're in trouble, right? So Charlie has to buy, but what would happen if the prices were such that Charlie bought? Yeah, because it has to be less than one dollar in total, which means that at least one of the goods has to be less than 0 0.5, which is less than 0 0.75, right? So Sonia would always buy in any case when Charlie buys. But if Sonia buys, then there's excess demand for at least one good. Right? Good. Um, okay, so the only efficient allocation is that Charlie gets both of the goods and Sonia gets neither, right? The reason is that um, Charlie gets less total utility, gets more total utility than Sonia does, and you can't satisfy them both, right? So that's the only efficient allocation. We know that markets have to be efficient, but that's not an equilibrium for the reasons we just said, right? Now, the key problem here is that there's only two people. Uh, sorry, imagine that we started with only two people and we didn't have competitive equilibrium. I mean, with two people, there's not a comp it's not competitive. Everyone knows they have an impact on price, right? And two people just like bargaining with each other could easily figure this out, right? If Charlie had both, he wouldn't be willing to sell them unless Sonia gave him w either of them, unless Sonia gave him at least one dollar, which he wouldn't be willing to do. And if Sonia had them, she would offer Charlie the pair of them for one dollar, right? So that's a monopoly model, right? That's not a competitive model, which is really the right thing to think about when there's only two people. But let's try to think about what would happen if we had an economy that was like this, but with lots of people, right? So imagine that there was like a bunch of people that were half of the population that were Charlie's, and there were half of the population that were like Sonia's. And there was enough of the goods to satisfy um, all of the Charlie's, uh, or to double satisfy all of the Sonia's, right? That, that's the corresponding situation with large numbers of people, right? So then, Munsu, can you see a equilibrium? Okay, so that, that means, mass of 0.5 means there's like, you know, if there's a million people, there's 500,000 uh, Charlies, there's 500,000 Sonias, and there's 500,000 of each of the two goods. Can you not sell it to another Sonia or another Charlie? What? Okay, if you're a Charlie, then can you not sell it to all You could sell it to anyone. It's a competitive market with lots of people. The question is, what would be an equilibrium here? two goods together are a dollar, but in a market, each good has to have a price of itself. You can't have a price for the goods together. For each of the goods? Yeah. So how is that in equilibrium? You need the total demand to equal the total supply, right? So how could that happen here if the goods were both 0.5? Anyone 
Anyone else? Uh, yeah, Tova. Uh, so all of the subunits were purchased at the lower price, um, and then we have that we have a population below satisfied, and then half of the trilies that was the, were purchased all of the remaining goods, and they would all be satisfied. Exactly. So the Sonias get divided up half and half on the two goods, right? And then the Charlies uh, soak up the rest. Okay. So why does that make sense? Well, I mean, think about it. The Sonia's sort of on average value the goods at 75 cents each, whereas Charlie's on average only value at half, uh, at 0.5 each, right? And that, um, you know, the way we think about things in price theory is all about these averages, right? And uh, the Sonia's are indifferent between the two goods at prices of 0.5. And the Charlie's, uh, are indifferent between buying both of the two goods and buying none of them at those prices. So as long as they, you know, some of them do one thing, some of them do the other, you can exactly satisfy the thing. So the problem when there was only one individual is that you couldn't have them half do one thing and half do the other. So Oliver, now do you see why it's really large numbers of people that's the right way to deal with these non-convexities, not large number, not individuals doing a little bit of it. Um, so, uh, is Arvid here? No, I guess not. Um, so, the problem is that in a finite economy, the aggregate demand could be one zero if Sonia buys one and Charlie doesn't buy uh, anything, or it could be zero one if Char Sonia buys the other one, or two one if Sonia buys one, or two one two if Sonia buys the other. So, what does that give us if, if we draw this out in this space? So here's the aggregate supply. It's 1, 1. And we could have something here, something here, something here, or something here. But we can't have the actual point. But the actual point is in between these. And if the price is 0 0.5, 0 0.5, the aggregate demand is all four of these points. It could be any of those things. So the aggregate supply lies between the aggregate demands, but it's not actually the aggregate demand. Right? Um, as a result, sorry, what are your coordinates here? Uh, how much? It's x and y. Like how much demand is for the first good? How much demand is for the second good? So therefore, aggregate uh, supply lies in the convex hull of aggregate demand, but it doesn't actually equal the aggregate demand. So having more people convexifies things, right? As we start to have more people, like rather than just being able to get one of these things, we could get the things that are like halfway in between or you know right there we can get different things and suddenly this whole thing starts getting filled in we could have any any of those points and then there's no problem so the only problems that can arise is the failure of the aggregate um, demand to lot to have all the stuff that's in between it filled in right do we, yeah it's a fun uh, do we need that like, even number of people uh, so if, if there's odd numbers of people, oh no, what's your name? You're not Zephan. Albert. Albert, Albert, sorry. You're Zephan. <laughs> um, so uh, you, if you have even numbers of people, you exactly clear the market. If you have odd numbers of people, you clear it minus one. So the fraction of, like the, as a fraction, the problem is very, very small. So that's what happens. Does that make sense? Um, okay, so this basic idea works um, even in a large finite economy. If there's an even number, it's perfectly cleared. If there's an odd number, then you clear it by one person. So the amount that you fail to clear is like related to the number of goods, not the number of people. So if you get a large number of people, you'll come very close to clearing the market. So um, I, I would say that you know the thing that's like a equilibrium here is that the prices are the large market prices and the efficient allocation. I think that's like close to being in equilibrium and you know the more people that there are, the more reasonable the price taking assumption is, the closer it will be to being an actual equilibrium. So this is a very simple example but it teaches some broader lessons that first of all having large number of peoples or ha people or having people be heterogeneous can convexify things and get rid of these weird uh, behaviors. So in most settings, if you have a problem with equilibrium existing, there's a way to add some noise 
that makes uh, things exist. And that's true in game theory as well as general equilibrium theory. Second, um, in general equilibrium theory, we always have large numbers of people if it's anything sensible, right? It's just crazy to think of a competitive economy without large numbers of people. And anytime there are large numbers of people, equilibrium always exists. Yeah, Oliver. What if you think you have a competitive economy in the sense of, say, Bertrand? Mm-hmm. Bertrand. Where, where, where people just undercut each other down to pricing. Yeah, so I mean, I think that's a great example of like the, you know, Bertrand assumes that people have know exactly each other's uh, cost. If you have uncertainty about that, everything will get smoothed out. So in, in these game theoretic contexts that lead to perfect competition, again, putting in some uncertainty or heterogeneity or these realistic features will smooth things out. Um, okay, so if uh, the real, if it's really an issue that there's a small number of people, you probably want to think about an oligopoly model rather than a perfectly competitive model. And if equilibrium fails to exist, you've probably written the model down wrong. It's not that like equilibrium doesn't exist, oh this is a crazy situation, which is a conclusion that a lot of people draw. No, it's just that like you haven't thought about what the situation you're modeling is correctly. Um, so equilibrium non-existence is not really a problem. The problem is you, the modeler, writing the model down wrong. So it's sort of like, it's like, you know, if you run a computer program and it spits out a bug, it doesn't mean the answer is the output that it gave you, uh, which is cr something crazy. It means that the problem is you didn't write the program correctly. Yeah, Tova. Um, I know this is considered a real problem, yeah. but what about Giffen goods? Giffen goods. We're going to talk about those in a minute. So. Um, in the worst case, uh, you can always change the notion of equilibrium to something like this approximate equilibrium, which, you know, maybe what you were trying to do in the model was really say, well, if we had an economy that was, you know, bigger or something, so you can always find some notion that's like that. And so the, the, the broader point is don't be a slave to definitions and formalism, and when a model spits out uh, impossibility or non-existence or whatever, you, you shouldn't conclude oh, everything goes to crap in this situation, you should instead conclude that you should think about the problem differently. Okay. So, in one of these competitive economies, what happens if, say, the supply of a good rises? Uh, Robert Kramer? Yeah, Robert, what, what, what generally happens in an economy when the supply of a good rises? Price falls and people buy more. Yeah, the price falls and people buy more, right? Um, and that comes from the normal supply and demand analysis. And this is still true in a, in a general economy when we have many, many goods, uh, but things are a little bit more subtle. So I want to look at this a little bit mathematically. So let's start with a single market like we were just talking about, where supply equals demand. And now we have this thing, little s, which might shift and increase supply, right? So um, is Charlie here? Charlie Sun? No. Um, does anyone else want to use the implicit function theorem to figure out what the effect of this S is on the price? Uh, Connor. Um, so it should be, uh, you just like do the chain rule um, to each one of those. Yep. So um, you just take the derivative with respect to S on that side. So what do you get? So you'll get 1 plus S prime P times DP DS. Yep. And, and, and what is what do you get in the end? Um, Try doing it on your paper. Or you can do it on the board if you prefer. Um, you should get. Um, one over. One over d prime p minus s prime. P. Yes. Exactly. So we said that when S goes up, the price should fall, right? So that's going to happen if D prime minus S prime is negative. Now usually we assume that D prime is negative, the demand slopes down, and S prime is positive, so the demand slopes up, so that immediately implies this. But notice that we don't need that. All we need is that demand cuts supply from below, sorry, from, from above to below. We don't need 
actually that uh, we only need that these things intersect in the right direction. We actually don't need that both of them go in the right direction, right? So the demand could slope upward as long as it doesn't slope upward as quickly as supply slopes upward. Or the supply could slope downward, but it just needs to not slope downward more quickly than the demand does. Okay. Um, and what would be so messed up about things going in the opposite direction, right? Imagine that things cut each other in the opposite way. Well, that would say, imagine the price were to rise a little bit above the equilibrium, then demand would actually get more large relative to supply at a higher price. And that would lead the price to go up even more, and more and more and more, and it would get out of control, right? and vice versa if the price fell a little bit below. So that means that that would be an unstable equilibrium, right? So it's not, the key issue that drives these basic conclusions we reach is not that demand goes down and supply goes up, it's rather that the equilibrium is stable, that it cuts in the right way. And um, the, the nicest way to formalize this is in terms of an excess demand function. That's demand minus the supply. And the, the, the excess demand flow function sloping downward is just what's needed for the equilibrium to be stable. So let me give you a picture of this. So let's let graph quantity as a function of price rather than price as a function of quantity. So even if supply is downward sloping, as long as it doesn't slope down as fast as demand does, then when supply increases, we get that the price falls like we want. But on the other hand, if the supply is sloping downward more quickly than the demand is, then when the supply increases, price actually rises. But that's a totally nonsensical situation, because if we started there and the price was a bit higher, then the, um, then the, uh, at a slightly higher price, the demand would actually be higher, sorry, at a higher price, Sorry, at a higher price, the demand would be larger than the supply would be, right? And that would lead the price to rise even more and we would go out of control. Whereas here, at least, even though one of the curves goes in the wrong, uh, opposite direction, things will stabilize. So there's a very tight connection between stability of an equilibrium and it giving you reasonable conclusions about what will happen. And this actually has a very tight analogy to individual maximization problems. So imagine that we have the maximization problem to maximize f of x minus t of x. Uh, now we know that um, x star has to fall when t increases in an individual maximization problem because otherwise clearly the person wouldn't be maximizing if when t increased they did more of uh, x, right? They could always have done uh, that before, and now they're getting penalized more for doing it, so what, what, th there's no way that they would ever do that, right? So let's now try to derive this using calculus. So we get that the first order condition is that f prime of x is equal to t, so what would um, dx, d, dx star dt be? Uh, does anyone want to derive that? Or sorry, is Adam son here? Go ahead, sing. Okay, um, so you think the derivative with respect to t? Yeah. That can be f double prime times dx dt. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So that will give you the right sign if and only if f double prime is negative. Right? Which we know is the second order condition for optimization, right? So if we look at a local minimum, of course we're going to get the opposite result. If someone's trying to like torture themselves, then if you say that doing more x tortures you more, you'll go higher. If someone's trying to help themselves, then, you know, as t goes higher, they're going to do less of the thing, right? So stability, what this shows, I think, is that stability in an equilibrium is really the exact same thing as the second order condition in an individual optimization problem, right? So that's true in two senses. Local, uh, we know that local concavity 
will give you the comparative statics in either an individual optimization problem or stability will give you comparative statics in, a, in an equilibrium problem. Now, what role does the second order condition play uh, in an individual maximization problem, not locally, but globally, uh, is Runan? Runan Yang here? No? Anyone else want to say what it does? What does global second order conditions do for you uh, in, yeah, Tova? I mean, doesn't that just uh, like guarantee the existence of an equilibrium? Uh, but more, more, even, something even more than that. What does it guarantee? If you have, in, just think of an individual maximization problem. Imagine it's concave everywhere. What does that guarantee you? Something stronger than existence. Uniqueness. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess you need that clearing. So that's in the, the equilibrium problem, but just in an individual maximization problem. Can anyone think? What? 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 It's well. well yeah, it's, it means that it's a global map. It means that any maximum, any, not only any maximum, any critical point has to be the global maximum, right? And it's similar in the equilibrium problem. What it says is that uh, if, if everything is stable, if demand always slopes downward relative to supply, then there can be at most one intersection between demand and supply, and that must be a stable equilibrium. So any intersection must be a stable equilibrium, just like any critical point must be the global maximum. So stability uh, is globally equivalent to uniqueness, but not just uniqueness, good uniqueness. Uniqueness of a stable equilibrium. Well, locally it's equivalent to comparative statics, and that's true in both the individual maximization and the uh, equilibrium problem. So more generally, you should always think of Whenever you think of stability in a market, you should always think of that as being just like second order conditions. And you should always, in the same way in an individual maximization problem, you check the second order conditions, you should check for the stability of the equilibrium. Okay. So these principles are called the correspondence principle. It means that there's a correspondence between the stability and either uniqueness or comparative statics. Um, so these are usually studied as separate topics, but really they're all the same thing. The comparative statics, the stability, and the uniqueness are all really the same concept, uh, if seen correctly. Okay, so there are two crucial differences that arise in a multi-market equilibrium than arise just in this individual uh, maximization problem. So one issue is that things are multidimensional rather than unidimensional. And Winnie, why does that complicate matters? Winnie? Yeah. What? Oh, sorry. Um, well. I don't really know what you're so why? So we just talked about stability and how that's related to comparative statics, and we talked about it in a one-dimensional problem, right? What, what, how is that more complicated in a multidimensional problem? what I'm driving at. Okay, uh, so like we, how do we define stability in a one-dimensional problem? Well, and we also said it was like how things cross each other, right? But how could you, what would that mean in a multi-dimensional problem, right? I mean, there's like, there's all these different things going all sorts of different ways. There's not, there's not a clear definition, right, of what it means to cross in the right direction. In, and in fact, you can use like some linear algebra thing, right, and you could say, well, there's like negative definiteness or something in an individual maximization problem, right? So that, that was, that, that's sort of the natural way to think about extending it. But there's another problem that we run into with that, which is income effects. So uh, Tyler, yeah, you're Tyler, sorry. Tyler, how, how would income effects complicate us trying to use the notion of negative definiteness? Um, I guess there, there are more variables to uh, take into account how they, well, there is an income effect affecting more variables so you don't know how they're interacting with each other. Yeah, so the, the key problem is, okay, so 
negative definiteness means that it only applies really for when we have a matrix that's symmetric. Any Hessian matrix, right, is symmetric about its diagonal. And ne negative definiteness is only defined for symmetric matrices. So there's actually not even a notion of that when you have income effects. Because when you have no income effects, the excess demand functions have a, have a symmetric Slutsky matrix, right? Because, uh, because that's sl what Slutsky symmetry tells us, right? But without, with income effects, that's not true. That matrix isn't symmetric, right? Of the, the gradient of the excess demands. And therefore, there's not even a natural notion of negative definiteness. Okay. So, much of the art of figuring out, and in fact, why all this stuff seems so complicated when you learn it in general equilibrium theory, is that the fact that this matrix is not symmetric and like how do you extend the notion of stability you can't just use negative definiteness the same way that we used these things crossing in the right direction uh, before right so there's two alternative approaches one is mathematical which I describe in the note that you guys had to read for class but the second is, co is conceptual and I think this is the more elegant one and this is something I'm working on right now which is to try to collapse things back to one dimension so in particular, imagine that we think of the excess demand in a market as a function of that individual price, not all of the prices at once. So how could we do that? Imagine that we have a single market as a function of just the price for that individual good. And then the way we make everything else work is we force all the other markets to clear instantaneously, given uh, that the price for that good is that value, right? We hold that good price fixed at that value, and then we let all the other markets clear given that. So that will give us some excess demand for this good, given that all the other markets clear, right? That will give an excess demand for this good as a function of just that good's price. Set that price, let all the other markets clear, tell me what the excess demand is for this pr good, good, right? And then you can look at, that's a one-dimensional graph, you can look at whether that is decreasing or not, whether that is crossing in the right direction. And that is exactly uh, stability. If that's true for all the goods, and you have all those crossings working the right way, th that is the right notion of stability. Yeah. Sorry, what's your name? Donnie. Donnie. And why is it reasonable to hold one constant? I mean, since they're all interacting with each other, you think that they have some... Well, because you check all of them at the... So if you check all of them, that sort of corresponds to the most robust notion of stability. Because basically what you're saying is, imagine this one is really, really slow to clear. So you're sort of holding it fixed. And all the other ones are really fast. And then this one is really slow, and all the other ones are fixed. So you're checking all the different ways in which the market could potentially be unstable. That's basically the, uh, the idea. Uh, remind me of your name. Jose. What? Jose. Jose. So how does this relate to one or so? To what? Uh, oh, Walrasian. So uh, this is all Walrasian equilibrium, but you mean the Walrasian auctioneer? Because this market is not actually being, uh, because you're setting this at a price that is not, like, if you, it's true this market would, if the other markets cleared, um, that's a good question. Um, um, it's a good question. I didn't have to think about that. I mean, what, what you're saying kind of sounds like 
proof that you go through all of, of not comparing and generally looking. No, that's true, but the question is how do you even do this exercise that's off the equilibrium path where you perturb one price, let all the other markets clear, and ask what the excess demand is for that good? It seems like that's true, but I, there's got to be something not true about that. I'm not quite sure what it is, but I, but, I, but I have to think about that. That's a very good question. Aren't you, like, externally disturbing the price? Isn't that important? Maybe. I, maybe. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It might be that she's right. It might be that basically all the other markets clear, but the, this price is sort of like a non, is not part of that equilibrium. You see what I mean? Like this, this price is being artificially held somewhere else, and then all the other markets are clearing. But yeah, it seems like Walras's law should imply that if all the other markets clear, it should clear too. I don't know. I have to think about it. I have to think about it. Um, Anyway, so uh, the, um, this is all useful not just for general equilibrium theory, but also for game theory. Um, and uh, the reason is that game theory is really just a system of equilibrium equations as well. Um, and uh, like in general equilibrium theory, uh, the gradient doesn't need to be symmetric. So uh, what is the, what are the first order conditions in general equilibrium, I and mean, what are the uh, equations in game theory? Well, they're for every agent that you have competing with, you know, participating in the game, their first order condition has to be satisfied given the actions taken by all the, by all the other players, right? So that gives you a system that's similar to all the excess demand equations being equal to zero, right? But um, so, Jose, I think the answer to your question is the following: um, the really what you're doing when you're like making that price different is you're like introducing some extra good into the economy that's held by somebody, and you have to account for that income effect of putting that extra good into the economy, uh, and you have to ask what would it be that would sustain a price that was different than what would be consistent with Walras's law. So you have, I mean, so that's not Im important when you have, like, when the income effects are, so like, th th that's what it's basically corresponding to. It's saying, if I were to introduce a bit of extra good into the economy, uh, distributed in some way, that um, caused the price to be uh, higher so that you could, you know, still be, be consistent, then w w what, what would that amount of that good that would have to be introduced look like? That, that's like the, the relevant function. I think that's true. I'm not 100% I'm not, I'm not sure, but I think that's what's going on. So the, the gradient, uh, when you have all those first, like those stacked first order conditions being equal to zero, if that was an individual optimization problem, the gradient of that would have to be symmetric. But of course, with a bunch of different people's uh, first order conditions, there's no reason why like, the derivatives of those first order conditions with respect to everybody's actions have to be symmetric. right? And so all the same issues that come up from non-symmetric uh, uh, gradients of the equilibrium conditions show up in uh, in game theory just as much as they show up in general equilibrium theory. Now we know that um, Giffen uh, effects are pretty rare and in some sense this is exactly like a Giffen good uh, when you have one of these failures of these things to uh, cut in the right direction, right? And so, in fact, all these instabilities 
are really generalized versions of some sort of a Giffen effect, right? Because if the axis demand slopes in the wrong direction, that's basically like a Giffen effect. If we have one of these more broad things, something slicing in the wrong direction, it's sort of a generalized version of a Giffen effect. So all of these um, instabilities are basically forms of Giffen goods. And those we know can only occur when income effects are very strong. Right? Yeah, Tova. Repeat that again. Yeah, okay. So if we think of a one-dimensional economy and we have an excess demand function that goes the wrong direction, that's basically a Giffen effect. Right? Now, if we think about a, one of these broader economies where there's no simple notion of things slicing and we just need one of these, um, we need uh, uh, instabilities occur if one of these like markets looping back to itself is basically Giffen-like, right? Um, then uh, that corresponds uh, that corresponds to some broader notion of, of, a, of a Giffen good. So. I, coming, I just keep coming back to Jose's question. It's a very good question. So I think that actually what's going on here is that you always need to remove one market from the analysis when you're doing the thing that I was saying. I think that, like, th let's think about the one good case. If we have a market and we just, uh, you know, one, if there's only one good in the economy, the market always clears, right? Because whatever the price is, it's paid back to itself and so forth. That's Walras's law, right? You need to have at least two goods for there to be an economy. So you always need to like hold one good fixed to even begin doing this analysis, and then you need to construct my excess demand functions. Because you know, one because like when I was doing the supply and demand thing, there was always an, a, a numeraire good that was allowing us to even construct the supply and demand graphs, right? So. Uh, when you have, it's only really when you have two goods that you can then ask whether things cross in the right direction. So really you need to like hold always one good fixed by, fixed by Walrus's law and then you need to do this loop, looping back thing that I was talking about before. Because otherwise there's just no way to even construct those curves because in a one good economy it's all by Walrus's law everything always needs to clear at any price. In other words you basically have to normalize the price of one good Right? Because Walrus's law is just it's gonna be trivial otherwise, right? So once one good's price is normalized, then that no longer holds and you can you can do this sort of an exercise. Okay, sorry. And, and back to your question, Tova. So what um, what's going on is that uh, in a one good economy, um, there's this um, S sloping wrong the excess demand, or really a too good economy by Jose's argument, sloping the wrong way is a, is a Giffen effect. In these more general economies, there's all sorts of Giffen-like things that can occur which correspond to different types of demand functions sloping in directions that they shouldn't be sloping in, basically. And so, just as in the one good economy, uh, sloping the wrong direction is a given like behavior that we shouldn't expect to occur very often. Similarly, all these instabilities are things we shouldn't expect to occur very often in these broader economies. So how does that work in game theory? Uh, in game theory, so I, I'm just talking about general equilibrium theory right now. And the point that I was going to make is that actually these issues are more relevant in game theory because there's just like good reasons why we think Giffen type like behavior doesn't happen at all in demand theory whereas in game theory it, it may well happen there's all sorts of reasons why we should believe it would happen whereas there's just de pure demand based reasons why we shouldn't think Giffen behavior should happen in particular it requires very very large income effects that we that we don't think are realistic so why are they not that realistic well, the reason is that most markets that we consider represent a small part of people's income, right? Why is that? Um, so, basically, uh, any given market, unless it's like potatoes in Ireland, right? All the examples we have of uh, things are very extreme income effects is when the market is for good, it's a huge part of people's income. But it's not just a huge part of people's income today, it's a huge part of their lifetime income, right? Because people should consume out of their lifetime income, and so like a short life change, even of a good that's really important to people's income, shouldn't cause huge income effects. 
because it's really their permanent income that's the relevant income. So the fraction of your permanent income that any given good at a given time could be is very, very small, right? And if that's true, then um, income effects in any given market are going to be uh, small. So uh, to give you a quantitative illustration of this, Bobby Willig looked at one particular uh, effect of not having income effects. So he looked at the ability to create calculations of consumer surplus. So consumer surplus as a notion, as you guys probably learned, depends on there being uh, no income effects, right? It, when there's income effects, you have to do all these complicated compensated variation and equivalent variation, yada yada, they're all really annoying, right? Uh, but um, what Willig argued is just the simple consumer surplus is in most relevant cases equivalent to this, or very, very close. Um, and this is just one thing that it, uh, results from income effects existing, but it's a natural way of measuring uh, whether income effects are significant uh, or not. So um, he asked, how close is consumer surplus to the ideal measures like compensating variation, et cetera, et cetera? So let's let A be the calculation of standard consumer surplus from some price change. And let's let I be the lifetime in in income of an individual. And let's let eta be the largest income elasticity of any good, uh, uh, sorry, of this good over the range where the price changes. And what he showed is that the error that you get um, is from uh, approximating things using the standard consumer surplus formula is less than that income elasticity multiplied by the standard consumer surplus calculation divided by twice uh, of the person's lifetime income. So imagine that the income elasticity is less than three in absolute value, which is a very large income elasticity, right? And that um, the uh, ratio of the consumer surplus change standardly calculated to the lifetime income is less than 1%, then the relative error that you're going to get is less than 1.5%. So what does that say? Even if the change that you're considering is 1% of people's lifetime income, the error is still going to be tiny in relative terms, much smaller than statistical error. Yeah, Oliver. But surely, if we think that, you know, the relevant areas that we can think of giving goods of people like that, like you said, the Irish potato, yeah. Surely that's an instance where, you know, people are credit constrained and their lifetime income isn't the relevant, um, the relevant thing to think about, it's their income here and now. Well, but then I think the right model is a model not with income effects, with no income effects, but with credit constraints. You know what I mean? So it's, it's not really an income effects type model. You should calculate the consumer surplus and with credit constraints, there's a very simple way to compute the loss in consumer surplus. It's basically like the loss that you get from not being able to borrow. Right? So that, that's a very different model, actually, than one where income effects are actually relevant. It's one where credit constraints are relevant. And credit con you can have lots of credit constraint models with just quasi-linear utility, no income effects, but then with a credit constraint, and then there's like a value of relaxing that credit constraint. And that's totally different than an income effects model because it's not Pareto efficient. Because there would be, you know, all the income effects models are all Pareto efficient. Credit constraints are not Pareto efficient because there would be a Pareto gain by allowing that person to borrow. But, but you could imagine a world where you have both effects, right? And where the income effects suddenly become relevant when everyone's credit constraints fine. Well, I mean, there are, there are weird demand effects coming from credit constraints, but it's not their lifetime income con, uh, constraint that's what is causing the weird effect. The weird Giffen-like behavior is being caused by the credit constraints that they're facing, not by the uh, lifetime yeah. income oh, well, yeah. what constraint. What I'm saying is that once you're credit constraint, you're not worried about lifetime income. No, I, I agree. And so you could get a Giffen like effect from that, but it, but like the right way to analyze it from a welfare perspective would not be to lo to do do cons equivalent variation, or whatever. It would be there would be a Pareto inefficiency from the fact that they were unable to borrow. Um, okay. So this is really tiny compared to measurement error in almost all relevant cases. 
And this is very related to Matt Rabin's observation, I don't know if anyone's ever read this paper, it's a nice paper, that um, over small stakes, uh, people basically have to be risk neutral. That like risk aversion is only a phenomenon when you're like risking your whole life. It's not a phenomenon that should matter in any standard problem. So like for example, when you're like doing an auction or any, anything that's just a small part of your life, you should never be risk averse. And that's why it's usually a very reasonable assumption as long as you're assuming people are rational to assume people are risk averse uh, in almost any standard micro problem. Tova? Yeah. So what about insurance? Insurance is a big problem. It's, I mean, insu most insurance is like some huge fraction of your lifetime income, right? But, but, but interestingly, you would want to do that for the shock that you get in the insurance, but you wouldn't want to do that for the amount that you're paying for the insurance. Because the amount you pay for the insurance is almost certainly a small fraction of your lifetime income, even though the shock that you might get that you're getting insured against is... So this is, this is the thing that's really important. You know, when you think about writing down a... Uh, quasi-linear model, which is what we do all the time when we think about consumer surplus, you really need to think about is the relevant change that is occurring in the price or whatever it is that I'm analyzing something that's a large or a small fraction of someone's lifetime income. Getting cancer is a large fraction of your lifetime income. So in that insur insuring yourself against cancer, you should consider that. But when you think about um, like the price of insurance and how that impacts your welfare, you shouldn't consider it. So like in the same insurance problem, you might well have quasi-linearity for thinking about price effects and competition and non-quasi-linearity for thinking about the actual product that's being sold. You see what I mean? Because it's really, quasi-linearity is an assumption that that's a fraction, small fraction of your lifetime income and the premium almost always is. But the shock that you get is not. And so you should consider risk aversion there and not in the, yeah, the uh, go ahead. Healthcare, um, I mean, in the reality, we, people don't just pay for catastrophic health care, right? They pay uh, insurance. They also pay for just copay, I mean, for like all along the way. So that seems like, I mean, it's not just risk aversion. I mean, you're paying for not well, just catastrophic health Yeah, and I, I think as we'll study when we do insurance, like, that sort of stuff is often a way for like where risk of where basically you can disregard the gains for, that people get from the insurance there, and almost all of it is about transferring risk, like mean risk, from you to the company. So like it's really only the catastrophic stuff that offers a. I mean, of course, it's a spectrum, but yeah, that's the, the place where it's really giving surplus rather than, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, you are, I'm trying to remember whether you're miles or, you're miles, right? Yeah, yeah, okay, good. So, so going back to the, the income tax, doesn't that assume that people rationalize consumption smooth over their lifetime a whole lot more than they actually do? To actually, I mean, I, I don't think that like, people are actually like, oh, I think I'm going to make a couple mil. Yeah, so, but, but, okay, so my main point here is really like, what, what is the right way to think about rational behavior? Now, irrational behavior is, is an important thing as well. However, irrational behavior should be studied the way that irrational behavior should be studied as an internality within the person, just as we were talking about with credit constraints. If you study it using instead the perfectly rational model, you will get totally the wrong normative conclusions that relative to what you, and they're totally different. Like, you're going to get, oh, everything's Pareto efficient, and, but, you know, we've got to take into account these complicated things. That's not how you should study it. The person is making a mistake, and you should try to correct that mistake. You shouldn't like say that's Pareto efficient and whatever. So like my point is that is actually by deconstructing what's actually going on in the rational model, you realize where you should be inserting irrationalities into the model. You know. Okay. Just just as a question, yeah. I mean like through experiment be able to like quantify from like a range from which this risk neutrality vanishes to like like what? Yeah, so, so Rabin has some nice calibrations on that. You should look at his paper. It's called Expected Utility Theory, a Calibration Theorem. It's a really nice paper. Okay, so let me just give you some calibrational examples of this. So Bob Lucas does these calculations, and he says that all business... Now, I don't really believe these calculations, but imagine that you believe them. And, and this is what most macro models are based on, by the way. All business cycles throughout history, he claims, 
is are worth about 0 0.0047 of GDP, uh, half a percent of GDP. So that would say that the error by using consumer surplus rather than income effects in those models would be less than uh, less than one percent. So what that basically says is all the macro models you've ever studied, you know how macro people are obsessed with always setting them up with income effects and not with quasi-linearity? That's just completely wrong. There's no need to like set them up that way. You can just set it up with quasi-linearity because basically like it, it makes no di quantitative difference whatsoever in those models to set things up with an in a budget constraint rather than, and it's so much simpler to do everything with quasi-linearity, right? All those models are basically quasi-linear models, and you're just approximating them to some incredible, incredible degree of accuracy that's way beyond uh, all the other errors you're introducing into the models. Or, according to the cost you know it all paper that we'll talk about a little bit later, all Ricardian trade, like all the Ricardian benefits from trade, are about 5% of world GDP. Now, Ricardian benefits are maybe not what we should be worrying about, but that, approximating that, not using any aggregate budget constraint, just using a pure quasi-linear model, which again, none of these international trade models ever do, because they're all like, oh, we've got to worry about the aggregate economy and general equilibrium effects and whatever. It, that only makes about an 8% error in the calculations you get from all gains from trade. Yeah, Arvid. Have you tried saying this like in a seminar? Like yeah, I say, like, I was like, look, the point of this class, I say all sorts of, cra if you come watch me in a seminar, I say all sorts of crazy things that drive the speaker crazy. I'm trying to teach you how to say the crazy things that I say in <laughs> seminar. <laughs> yeah, of course. What, what is their reaction to that, that they just need to? Well, they usually, they usually like, you know, don't pay attention until they get me as a referee. You'll see, this is like one of many very controversial things you'll hear me say during yeah, this okay. class. But, but it's not that controversial based on the analysis. No, it's no. And it's, it's in the literature. It's been in the literature for 20 years. It's just people haven't learned it. There's lots of stuff that's been in the literature for 100 years and nobody's learned. So, um, so this says that even super macro things uh, there's still like basically no loss from assuming quasi-linearity. Um, and for standard things in micro, there's far less, right? So, and one of the main reasons for this is the permanent income hypothesis because the relevant income is really your lifetime uh, income, right? And um, so like, for example, think of a political election. How much would you be willing to pay to um, you know, influence, like to change the outcome of an election. I think most people would be willing to pay less than about $1,000. Imagine your lifetime income is about $5 million. Then the error from using quasi-linear model to think about most elections is three hundredths of 1%. So if anyone tells you, oh, but you need to worry about income effects in elections, which I hear all the time when I talk about quadratic voting, that's just ludicrous. It's just, there's, there's no effect. I mean, there's like, as you would think of a hundred thousand other things before you would think about putting income effects into such a model. Um, how about doubling the price of cars in an I.O. model? So a lot of I.O. models, people say, oh, but you don't think about, you know, the fact that there's income effects in there. That's, that causes about six-tenths of one percent error, even if the price of the car doubles, which is way bigger than any effect you'd ever get in a BLP uh, model of the car industry. Yeah, Lancelot. But those, they were all about the consumer surplus, right? Yeah, but that's all, in the end, that's what people are trying to calculate in these models. And, and like, if you do, if you were to do this, how close is Slutsky symmetry to holding, you would get something very similar. I mean, it's basically the same thing. Uh, yeah, Connor. Are there any similar such bounds on the error for producer surplus? So producer surplus is always, quasi-linearity is always correct, because there's no income budget constraint for firms, usually. Yeah, Arvid. So this could my become an issue when you get to the end of the lifetime for people who go like into retirement and like Yeah, so I'll talk I'll talk about that in a, in, a, in a second. Yeah. But that those are the times when income effects could matter. Uh, maybe. It depends how much le you're left and yeah. I, I mean the main thing that's going to matter is bequests for those people. Like if if something changes but you know the value of a bequest is there something really that's going to shock that? I don't know. 
you know, because most people at the end of their life are leaving significant bequests. Um, eliminating fee all fees on investment over the course of people's lifetime, that, that, that would give them about $30,000 gain. So that's an error of point of uh, 1%, basically. So if you're thinking about finance problems, there people think you really need risk aversion. Not really. I mean, for thinking about like the shocks to the investment, but not for thinking about uh, the prices that they're paying for those investment products. It makes almost no difference. The estate tax, even an estate tax, so like someone who left $5 million maybe would pay an estate tax, I don't know, of $500,000. Even there, you only get a 15% error. Now, that, there it's starting to matter a little bit, and there it might be getting closer to being first order. But the main, big point is that for most things we're going to think about, quasi-linearity is really the right assumption. Now, the question is, where might income effects actually start to matter? Uh, what do you think, Jack? What are, what are some problems that we might study where you think income effects might actually start to matter? Anything that affects lifetime income, like human capital investment. Mm-hmm. What sort of policy interventions might we study where, where that might matter? Education. Yeah, maybe. Maybe, yeah, but with the price of education, yeah, maybe, maybe like changing how much education people get, it could matter there. Like early interventions, especially. Early life, uh, child interventions, it could matter yeah. significantly there. Yeah, Donnie? Maybe immigration, something like that, which would have a huge effect on your lifetime income. Yeah, S someone moving across the border Things in developing countries, maybe, where people's lifetime income is low? Yeah, Lancelot. Maybe it doesn't matter too much for one election, but for switching the whole political system? Yeah, switching the whole constitution. <laughs> it could matter there. That's right. Um, another, so some other examples are, you know, um, changes that are like really concentrated in people's lives, uh, lar like changing the whole income tax system might make a big difference to people's lifetime incomes. But for, so for the, most of the course, we're going to totally ignore this. And this is going to be a huge benefit because we're going to be able to do everything with consumer surplus calculations. All equilibrium is just going to be like individual maximization. Because when you have no income effects, then the Slutsky matrix is symmetric. And we don't need to worry about any of these issues we were talking about. Um, and. But you should be careful because if there's like a really big policy shock that really affects people's lifetime income, then you do need to worry about this. So optimal taxation, even though we're going to ignore income effects because they turn out to actually like cancel out when you look at them in empirically, uh, th they're not that imp important. But setting up a constitution or a country going to war, there, there are things that, that would really matter in terms of income effects. Yeah, Oliver. Okay, so quasi-linear, to me, whether quasi-linear preferences are supported is a question of whether uh, rationality is supported. Yeah, yeah. In other words, like, I do think there are huge deviations from quasi-linearity, but those are deviations from rationality, not from quasi-linearity. Like, I just think it's an incredibly stupid idea to, like, pretend like the rational model is consistent with behavior that is manifestly irrational. Uh, bec because you can construct crazy versions of the rational model that are inconsistent with empirical re reality and that are infinitely flexible. You know what I mean? Um, okay, so uh, why do we... Uh, okay, so now um, I want to combine the comparative statics thing with this quasi-linearity and I want to start to think about why do we care about these comparative statics um, and the reason is that many, if not most, problems in economics are in some way about incidence. Because what we're usually interested in is who in the end is going to pay for something, some shock that occurs in the economy, right? And while this may sound narrow, there are, so, there are a bunch of things in economics that are equivalent. So for example, how, how does the entry of a new good into a market affect welfare? That's basically an incidence question because it's all like how is it split between producers and consumers? Who gets the benefits of an existing market or of trade occurring? 
Um, imagine that one side of the market is really well organized and able to influence its political, the political process, and another side is not. Uh, whose interest should you uh, uh, attend to, or how should you adjust what that person is doing in order to change things? That depends on how the benefits are split between them and the other side of the market. The optimal taxation of international trade depends heavily on incidents. And we'll discuss lots of other problems throughout the course that depend on incidents. And um, as with the correspondence principle, I want to focus on the one market case, but you can basically aggregate this to many markets uh, in, in a relatively straightforward way. And we're going to assume quasi-linearity for the reasons we've said, and that's going to make all this incident stuff uh, much, much simpler. And we're going to return throughout the course to incidents under many different forms of organization. We're going to start by talking about perfect competition and we'll move on to uh, imperfect competition, a monopoly. And there are going to be basically five principles of incidence that will tie all these analyses and a lot of our thinking throughout the course together. Okay. So the first principle of incidence is the uh, comparison between physical and economic incidence. And um, there the key point is that it doesn't matter, is, is Jackson Jenkins here? No. Um, the key point there is it doesn't matter who pays uh, for the tax, whether it's consumers or whether it's producers. One dollar tax on an activity will end up being borne by consumers or producers uh, in a way that is irrelevant to who physically pays the tax. And the reason is, you know, if you have the consumers pay the tax, right, then they'll buy less of the good, that will reduce the price, and the producers will end up bearing some of the tax, and vice versa. The second principle is that if, at least for the first un small unit of a tax, the revenue raised by the tax is just equal to the tax times the quantity in the market. Yeah. Uh, when you said pay, yeah, are you referring to like the party who's like actually paying? Physically it? paying it. Yeah. So, okay, so the physical payment is is independent of the economic incidence. Who actually bears the tax is irrele It's irrelevant who pays the tax. Um, okay. The second principle is that a small tax is the revenue raised is exactly equal to the quantity times the amount of the tax. Now, when we get beyond a small tax, that's not true, but for a small tax, that is true. Another way of putting that is that the um, direct burden of the tax uh, is exactly the quantity times the amount of the tax. Okay. Now, um, the third principle is that uh, the amount of that tax, so that's the total burden of the tax, the question is, how is that total burden of the tax split between consumers and producers? And it's split into rate, which we call the pass-through rate, which is how much, if we put a tax on the producers, gets passed on to consumers. So consumers will pay the pass-through rate times the quantity, because that's how much their price rises, and then they pay that on all the quantity they consume by the envelope theorem, because we can always treat the amount that they choose to purchase as fixed. And if it is fixed, then they pay exactly how much their price rises by. And the producers, also by the envelope theorem, because they're price takers, uh, will pay 1 minus the pass-through rate times the quantity in the market. Remind me of your name. Franklin. Franklin, yeah. Wait, so for small taxes, are you saying it's non-distortionary? Exactly. Okay. The first unit of a tax is not distortive. There's no excess burden. And that's even true for like not that small of a tax. So like, a, you know, like a 5% tax has very little distortion. Say. Unless it's distorting pre-existing behavior in the economy. Because the reason is that it's only a triangle, not a square. Right? And that tri triangles are small. Okay, so... Um, the, we can then call the incidence of a tax the ratio of how much it is paid by the consumers to how much is paid by the producers, which is pass through over one minus the pass through rate. Okay. The third thing is what determines that pass through rate. 
and that's going to be equal to 1 over 1 plus the elasticity of demand divided by the elasticity of supply. And Albert, can you derive that? You, on the board or, or, yeah, on the board's probably the best way so people can see it. So we, ha we derive it from this equation that the demand is equal to the supply of the price minus the tax, right? right. Because the supplier only gets that. So can you drive that? Maybe that's the best board over there. What do you want? Don't, don't look at the derivation as you do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want you to derive the why the pass-through rate. It, there's there's chalk over there, but oh. why is the pass-through rate? That is how much the price increases when the tax increases. Um, why is that equal to 1 over 1 plus the ratio of elasticity of demand to the elasticity of supply? S of P minus T. It is S, S prime, right? Yes, One thing, right? The, the S prime is up there too, right? Good. So now, how can you get 1 over 1 plus the elasticity of demand over the elasticity of supply? What do you mean? You want to get this formula up there. basically just turn these derivatives of demands into elasticities because you divide by the demand and the supply is equal to the demand and then you divide by the price and multiply by the price and you and the elasticity of demand is negative the demand is negative of the uh, whatever and and and, and the, that gives you the, the formula there you go Thanks. nicely done <laughs> um, okay so here's the, that derivation Okay, now the, the fifth principle is that a discrete change in a tax uh, has the same incidence as the quantity averaged uh, as the regular thing, but you have to have the quantity average pass-through rate. That means that if there's some range and we've got a little pass-through here and the next pass-through there and so forth, you have to average the pass-through rate over the range of the tax change. Uh, by the quantity that is sold when the tax is equal to that quantity. Um, now, raising the tax to infinity from uh, zero kills the market off, right? There will be no goods sold in the market once the tax is equal to infinity, right? And so the, um, so the total consumer surplus divided by the total producer surplus is the average pass-through rate divided by 1 minus the average pass-through rate. Where average is quantity weighted between a tax of 0 and a tax of infinity. So, one interesting thing that that says is that the tax 
falls on whatever side of the market benefits most from the market existing in the first place, in some sense. Right? So a lot of people say, oh, if you pose the tax, it's all going to be borne by the consumers, poor consumers. Well, it's poor consumers because they're the ones who benefited from the market being there. Yeah, Tova. Sorry, what's your P-bar? It's the average pass-through rate between zero and infinity. Uh, yeah. Where, where the average is weighted by the quantities at the relevant rates. Okay. Um, so, we definitely didn't get through the trade stuff. Uh, we'll try to do that at the start of the next lecture. We may get a little bit behind, and, but I'll try, to, I'll try to catch up. I don't think it's worth trying to launch into the international trade stuff and do that partially uh, today. But I hope you guys uh, got something out of all that GE theory. That's my version of GE theory. Not so much math, but a lot of crazy ideas. So. <laughs>